Esteemed guests, friends, advocates of democracy, I am so pleased to welcome uh, you all today to the very first public event for the Middle East Democracy Center, or MEDC. I'm Tess McEnery, the executive director. MEDC was founded just this January. It's a merger of the Project on Middle East Democracy, or POMED, and the Freedom Initiative two organizations with over 25 years of combined efforts to support democracy and freedom in the Middle East and North Africa. This merger arose at a vital inflection point of rising authoritarianism and human rights violations across the MENA, issuing a clarion call that this region cannot be exempt from the global reckoning between democracy and autocracy. There are widespread calls for dignity, justice and freedom that have been met with brutality, empty rhetoric, war, and resurgent authoritarianism that has left so many displaced, disillusioned, and with little hope for their future. The founding of MEDC intends to turn this tide, building on the rich legacies of POMED and the Freedom Initiative. The mission of MEDC is to work tirelessly alongside the people of the MENA region to challenge authoritarian systems, free the unjustly detained, and advocate for US policies that protect human rights and advance a bold vision for democracy. So today's panel discussion is not only MEDC's first public event, it also launches our Democracy Matters initiative. This initiative will forge strong and diverse coalitions of pro-democracy actors across the region, uniting them in common purpose, to articulate bold visions for democratic progress, to devise strategic approaches for reform, and to craft compelling narratives that underscore why democracy matters. During a challenging time of war, immense suffering in Gaza and across the region, and ongoing US support for the war in Gaza, today's event and the Democracy Matters Initiative makes the case that democracy is not just a political system, but the driving force for positive change, a guarantor of human rights, and a pathway for a peaceful and prosperous Middle East. So to get our event started, I will be passing the mic to Yasmin Omar, director of this Democracy Matters initiative and the moderator of today's event. Yasmin is an international human rights lawyer who has dedicated her career to defending victims of human rights violations. Before joining MEDC, Yasmin served as a consultant with the United Nations team of experts on rule of law and sexual violence in conflict. I want to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all of those who have contributed to the realization of MEDC and this initiative, our panelists, Dr. Hesham Sam, Dr. Nancy O'Kale, and Dr. Shana Marshall, our partners, our supporters, and the courageous individuals on the front lines of the fight for democracy. I want to thank all of you here and online for your attendance, your voices, your support, and now, over to Yasmin. Thank you, Tess, so much for the kind introduction and uh, for the inspiring remarks. And again, welcome uh, to our event. Um, I'm Yasmin Omar. I'm a human rights lawyer, and I'm the director of the Democracy Matters Initiative. And um, today is a significant milestone for MEDC as we launch, uh, as we gather to mark the launching of our new initiative. And uh, we seek through this initiative to strengthen the understanding of why democracy matters, especially during a time of unprecedented regional and global challenges. Today, we are having this critical discussion on Egypt's political landscape as Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, is set to be inaugurated next week for a third uh, presidential term, this event couldn't be more timely as Egypt finds itself at a crossroad grappling with the aftermath of a rushed election, very controversial circumstances, and an ongoing uh, govern governance challenges. Sisi's ascent to power and subsequent rule has been marked by violent repression. 
the stifling of any opposition, and an ongoing human rights crisis. This tenure thus far has been characterized by authoritarian, uh, authoritarian domination that left the political scene in a precarious state of economic uncertainty, social and political un uncertainty, and as a CC embarks on his new term, concerns about trajectory of Egypt's, of Egypt's democracy, foreign policy, impact on the Egyptian citizen and the region, the wider region looms large. Adding to these challenges, of course, is the current Israeli genocide in Gaza and the catastrophic humanitarian crisis on the border, which further complicates Egypt's economic and political hardship and provides a pretext for, 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 further, for further tightening of control and abuse of power, especially in the time of prevailing U.S. indifference towards human rights violations in the region. Concerns about Concerns about all of this is going to be our subject of discussion. Um, I would like to thank our, on, our, our esteemed guests and speakers for joining us today to dissect into Egypt and the impact of its autocratic ruling on the region and on the, afterward, the aftermath of the war. First, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome uh, and introduce Dr. Hisham Salim, Associate Director uh, for Research and at, at Stanford University Center uh, on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. Welcome, Dr. Hisham, and thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Uh, joining Dr. Hisham is Dr. Shayna Marshall, Associate Director of the Institute for Middle East Studies and Assistant Research Professor of International Affairs at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. Thank you so much for joining us today. And lastly, we have Dr. Nancy O'Kill, the President and CEO of the Center for International Policy. And of course, she's an esteemed scholar with long time uh, expertise on Egypt and the MENA region. And please, we have the full biographies printed over there uh, uh, in our today's event program. Together, and with our esteemed experts, we're going to discuss the complexities of the current political climate in Egypt and try to offer analysis and actionable insights for what's coming after. Um, before we proceed, I would like to draw your attention to Dr. Salem's recent publication for the Journal of Democracy, um, The Autocrat in Training, the CC Regime at 10. We have a few copies printed here. For those who are following us through live streaming, please visit our event page on mideastdc.org to find the link to the publication. And without further ado, uh, we'll delve into today's discussion, starting with Dr. Hisham. Well, your fascinating paper has brilliantly brought an analysis of the characteristic of President Ad Fattah Sisi's ruling, and from borrowing and, sprint and spending sprees to utilizing repression for silencing opposers, to even revamping the political uh, figures and political scene to apply further political scene monopoly. Uh, how has the autocratic ruling in Egypt over the past decade shaped the country's political and economic landscape? And what key factors have contributed to the current situation? Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, before I say anything, I should uh, start off by thanking the uh, Middle East Democracy Center, especially uh, Yasmin Omar, for the kind invitation. I'm so delighted at the opportunity to engage with the center's wonderful community and to share some of my modest uh, thoughts and reflections on the current state of Egyptian politics. Uh, I should also mention how honored I feel to be speaking alongside two scholars whose work has been so enlightening and so insightful on a host of different questions, but especially the questions that we're discussing today, Dr. Sheena Marshall, Dr. Nancy Oqil, uh, I feel very privileged to be in their intellectual company and to really be standing in their light right here at this event. And uh, finally, since this is the center's inaugural event, I should also take this opportunity to thank and uh, recognize and congratulate the two incredible and strong communities that came together to form this center in what can only be described as the deal of the century, so to speak. <laughs> This is like Kobe Shaq type level partnership, right? <laughs> Minus all the drama, well, uh, yeah. as far as I can tell. <laughs> but uh, I'm, uh, in all seriousness, I'm very excited about this partnership and everything that it promises to deliver to advocates of democratic change in the countries of the Middle East and uh, North Africa. 
So I think your question, Yasmin, uh, I think it compels us to add a little bit of uh, analytical and historical depth to everything that we've been reading from and about Egypt over the last few years. Uh, I'm going to preface by saying that notwithstanding everything that we've been reading in the news about investment deals, about aid packages, loan agreements that Egypt may have negotiated in the last several weeks, the fact remains that on a basic and fundamental level, Egypt's economic predicament still has not changed and still remains the same, right? So we're still talking about a rapidly deteriorating economy with prices rising up to unprecedented levels in ways that are imposing serious hardships on middle and low income households. We're still talking about uh, a heavily indebted state uh, with total government debt as of last year reaching 160 billion US dollars. And this is also around the same time when Egypt became the second most indebted country in the world to the IMF. Uh, second to Argentina. And we're still talking about a reality in which a good chunk of the government spending is still going to servicing debts in a way that is limiting the capacity of the state to protect vulnerable social groups who are experiencing the wrath of the current economic downturn. And by the way, this is a big deal in a country where a third of the population actually lives below, below the poverty line. And that number usually rises up to above 50% if you add the households that live right above or barely above the poverty line. So you're still talking about a fairly uh, vulnerable, tenuous and perhaps even precarious economic situation. How did we get here? So I have two points to make. The first point is that the problem is fundamentally a political one. It's very tempting and it's very easy to reduce Egypt's economic problems to the missteps of one government or another, or the impact of one global or regional crisis or another. But the big elephant in the room with us is Egypt's close political space, which has remained shut down for the past 10 years and has been fairly out of commission, leaving no room for accountability or transparency, leaving no room for debating economic public policies or deliberating over the wisdom or lack of wisdom behind them, leaving no room for contesting the enormous and costly and burdensome privileges that the military has been able to accumulate over the course of the past decade, and leaving no room for pushing back against the, sta the state's continuing transgressions against longstanding social and economic rights. So if we're talking about the roots of economic precarity, I think it's very important to take into consideration the political dimensions of this as well. Because frankly, and to state this candidly, the complete absence of accountability and transparency has been, like the least to say, is disastrous for governance outcomes in Egypt, and has in fact provided the permissive conditions for the type of economic mismanagement that we've seen over the course of the past 10 years. So as you all know, this is a political leadership that has spared no effort in using deadly violence and politically motivated prosecutions against dissidents from across the ideological spectrum. Human rights groups estimate that there are about 60,000 political prisoners in the country today. Uh, we, uh, beyond the fact that state managed elections and political party life are effectively uh, monopolized by the regime, as you alluded to earlier, Yasmin, there's also a very critical development that happened in the course of the past decade and that is currently shaping the realities that we're living through, which is that nearly all privately owned media outlets were taken over by the security sector through pro proxy ownership. What does that mean? That means that the spaces available to present alternative viewpoints are virtually non-existent in the country. So that is to say the story of the past decade is not just the story of economic mismanagement and disarray, but it has been the story of a deepening authoritarianism and a shrinking political space, a shrinking space that is leaving no room for peaceful expressions of dissenting viewpoints. So I would argue that these two stories are not only related, but are in fact deeply intertwined. Because on one level, the exclusionary economic path Egypt has taken over the course of the past 10 years has deepened the state's reliance on repression, and which has become a key instrument in uh, containing socioeconomic grievances and also in preempting any attempts on the part of any political actor to uh, politicize socioeconomic grievances. But on a different level, the absence of accountability and transparency has become a recipe for economic mismanagement and the type of irresponsible and imprudent uh, economic policy making that we've observed over the past uh, few years. Uh, so, uh, you know, if we're talking about um, Egypt's close political space, this is not just a side issue 
in discussing the current economic realities in Egypt, right? So, I mean, um, it's, it's easy to lose track of the fact that this actually constitutes a critical condition to understanding how the economic path that Egypt has taken on since 2014 has come about, an economic path, uh, as you suggested earlier, that has put so much emphasis on large-scale spending, on uh, state-led and politically motivated mega projects, without a whole lot of consideration to the debts that these projects are accruing, without a whole lot of consideration to their overall impact on private sector development and export-oriented manufacturing sectors, and definitely not a whole lot of consideration to their overall impact on social spending and distributive justice uh, more generally. So, uh, you know, the second point that I'm going to make before I hand this back to you, Yasmin, and perhaps this is a longer point, is that this economic path, uh, path that, I, that I'm referring to was largely predicated on this very problematic, if not completely disastrous assumption that Egypt is too big to fail. Or the idea that the enormous amount of aid that Egypt began to receive from its international partners, especially Gulf countries starting 2014, uh, not to mention the generous access to credit was able to secure through IFIs and other lenders, that that was unlimited and that is something that would remain forever. And I think that mirage of abundance, that illusion of abundance that emerged in 2014 encouraged the government to take on a lot of bad spending habits, bad spending habits that it couldn't backtrack from down the line once political coalitions and bureaucratic interests started to form around them, but it also encouraged the government to begin uh, resorting to um, these really uncalculated borrowing sprees on the faith that a major bailout will come down the line. Why? Because Egypt is what? Egypt is too big to fail. And, you know, Eventually, uh, you know, and it's not surprising, by the way, that you know, at certain points in time, a lot of observers were noting that you know, Egypt was borrowing money in order to meet its monthly debt payments, and everybody was saying, well, what are you doing? You're digging yourself deeper and deeper into debts. Well, they're not just digging yourself deeper and deeper into debts. They're buying time. This is what happens when you try to buy time, knowing that a major bailout will come down the line because, as I said, Egypt is too big to, Egypt is supposedly too big to fail. Except that Egypt is too big to fail paradigm has proven to be deeply flawed, not only because of all of the debts that resulted in accumulating, but also because Gulf generosity towards Egypt has in fact waned in more recent years. Why? It's not complicated. It's not a mystery. It's because the threat of a counter coup or an insurgency in Egypt has largely subsided compared to that 2014 moment when that regime first came into formation. But also these countries have just been reluctant to cut uh, the government any more blank checks, fearing that they would, uh, they would be stuck bankrolling the government's bad spending habits indefinitely. So what have they been doing? They've been banding behind the IMF, demanding that Egypt undergo deep, structural economic reforms before receiving any further major uh, bailouts. And I should mention economic reforms that will probably generate a good amount of uh, social discontent and economic unrest. But just to put this into perspective and to just sort of state it colloquially and, cl and, and, and clearly, when your Gulf friends who are not exactly known for their spending inhibitions or fiscal responsibility, like when they have to stage an intervention to force you into spending less money, this is when you know that you messed up big time and that things have gotten really out of hand. But anyway, the, the, it remains to be seen whether those countries will, uh, will soften their position in response uh, to the ongoing regional developments, which Dr. Nancy Oqil will be um, uh, will be discussing, uh, including the war on Gaza and its geopolitical and economic impact on Egypt. Uh, but so far, at least in my modest assessment, I don't see any clear signs that Gulf countries will be willing to give Egypt unconditional economic aid anytime soon, unconditional being the key word here. Mm -hmm. So just to recap, where does this leave us? In my own mind, the story of the past 10 years is not the story of how the war in Ukraine or the COVID-19 pandemic or the war on Gaza have been unkind to the Egyptian economy. But rather, the story to me is about how the Egyptian economy was vulnerable to these successive shocks 
because of an economic path that began in 2014 and that hedged one too many bets on unconditional and on unlimited bailouts. These are a set of uncalculated risks that the political leadership took at the backdrop of a very close political space that left very little room for public policy deliberation, let alone any type of transparency or accountability. So this is the truth as I see it, and I'll stop here and hand it back to you, Yasmin. Thank you. Dr. Hashem, this was really fascinating, and you really made it easier for us to go through this discussion, bring, bringing the layout of the circumstances in Egypt now, military economy, and that's exactly what we needed to approach the second question with, uh, with Shana. And, uh, Dr. Hashem spoke about the lack of accountability, transparency, and it's all like military characteristics in Egypt. And given their control of, the, of all aspects of political and social and economic life, I wanted to ask you, can you please elaborate on the role of military in Egypt economy, including the influence on, on decision-making process and the impact of weapon, weapon transfer uh, uh, deals on both the economy and the society and the way the military acts on daily life. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you, Hashem, for those really wonderful um, and very well-organized comments. I hope that I can even approach that level of organization. Um, so, right, there's two sort of separate but intertwined issues, right? The first is military ownership across really all sectors of the economy, right? So, of course, the military has always had factories where it produced things like appliance, you know, consumer appliances, pasta, bottled water, weapons, uh, automobiles, you know, fire trucks, ambulances, um, dishware, cutlery, <laughs> so really across the entire spectrum. Um, but then after 2013, there was a massive expansion um, of that. So some of that was um, basically taking over small shares of existing firms. A lot of it was new contracts when Hashem was talking about these mega, con mega projects. A lot of that was new contracts for all of the, the Suez Canal expansion, the second administrative capital, um, the construction of large residential housing units, which was underwritten in many cases by Gulf investment, but the subcontracts and the actual work itself was often doled out to military firms who often would also then subcontract it out even yet to other firms and then were just sort of skimming off of the top. And we know how sort of ingrained the officer elite is in this entire system. They're, you know, often they are the suppliers or the sub-subcontractors within a lot of these sort of new projects. Yazid Saig has written, you know, very extensively about this. So there was really just an explosion in the amount of money that was coming into Egypt after 2013, largely from the Gulf states, but I should also note all from a lot of European and American sort of multinational conglomerates, right, and contractors and builders, right? So it wasn't like there was a, a military coup and all of these European and American firms were like, oh, no, we better not do business in, in Egypt because it's, you know, they had a military coup. They were like, oh, great, let's go do business in Egypt because they had a military coup, right? Because the, what they're looking for is, is stability and predictability, Right. And what they saw under Morsi's government, which was, you know, there were certainly internal <laughs> problems, but there was also a lot of undermining of, of that government from abroad, primarily from the Gulf states. Right. Because that was a, a threat to their own regime legitimacy. Right. The rise of a democratically elected but religiously oriented government, if that was possible in Egypt, then maybe that would be also be possible in the Gulf states, right? So they were very, um, very nervous about the prospect that this could sort of threaten their own sort of legitimacy. And so you have all of this, um, this, this new money just sort of pouring into to Egypt after 2013. And you also have, of course, all the arms manufacturers, right, in, in Germany, in Spain, in, in especially in France, and in the United States saying, great, you know, the military is back in control all of these projects, all of these weapon sales that, you know, were, we were teed up for, um, that Gulf money is going to underwrite a lot of these new uh, weapon sales and, you know, we're, we're going to be sort of raking it in. And in fact, Germany and France, I think, had their, you know, biggest sales years, several years in a row, 
largely due to Egyptian weapons purchases, which is really incredible if you think about it in the context of this uh, burgeoning sort of debt crisis. Why are they spending, you know, this enorm really enormous amount of money um, on on weapons imports? But for international <laughs> business elites, they were they were excited about this. Um, so you have uh, the you know the issue of military ownership, and then you have the issue of these recurring sort of economic crises, which the late um, political economist Samer Soliman right wrote extensively about in his book *The Autumn of Dictatorship*, which is a really um, excellent text about the Mubarak years. Um, but he points to uh, the sort of the ability of Egypt to always overcome these crises at the very last minute because there's some sort of global geostrategic meltdown. Uh, which Egypt is central to sort of ameliorating, and so they get sort of bailed out. So in the in the 70s, right, Egypt was heavily in debt, um, and they were able to sort of switch from their Soviet client status to uh, to being a U.S. client, right, because that um, battle between the U.S. and the Soviet Union was really starting to disintegrate. Of course, the Soviet Union had had funded an enormous amount of the infrastructure projects that actually went on in Egypt. Um, and, and then they switched sort of to, be, to becoming a US client state. And there's this massive influx of new investment that sort of allows them to avert that crisis. And then they're again on the verge of bankruptcy in 1990. And what happens? The US invades Iraq, right, and asks Egypt if they can have overflight and refueling access. And so the Egyptians say, yes, if you forgive all our debt, the Americans say, yeah, let us go to the IMF and make sure everybody's cool with that. Works out really well for them. And then in 2013, of course, again, there's a, a, a massive crisis, and the Gulf states come in with tens of billions of dollars, you know, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and then under Morsi, uh, investment money from Qatar. Um, and that sort of ameliorates that crisis. And now, of course, they're talking about we're in another crisis again. They're going back to the IMF. They're renegotiating all of these loans. We can talk about the status of those negotiations later, maybe. Um, and then, of course, um, the Israeli genocidal war on Palestine breaks out and they say, oh, well, you know, maybe uh, Egypt can get a better deal if they'll just let all these uh, refugees into uh, uh, through Rafah um, out of Gaza. And of course, you see the military building, right, um, uh, sort of a, a, I guess, a two mile long, you know, perimeter um, between them and Rafah and then sort of some infrastructure that's ostensibly potentially meant to house these Gazan refugees that are fleeing through Rafah. So again, you have this sort of last minute 11th hour um, sort of miracle um, that is going to allow the, re the regime to sort of avert that economic crisis. Um, and in particular, the in this current context, this massive sort of repeated sales of state-owned firms, I think um, the current sort of wave of privatizations, right, there's 38 of the remaining sort of state-owned firms across 18 sectors that the IMF has said that Egypt needs to uh, needs to privatize, and then the Gulf states, of course, coming in and saying, you know, we'll we're happy, you know, to invest in these firms, but that also means that now the these Gulf states actually own are going to own um, a lot of Egypt's economy, and so what you you're seeing like a tension between uh, CC's government trying to placate the Gulf states by allowing them um, to sort of buy up all of the, what are left, I would say, are like the crown jewels of the state-owned economy, right? The tobacco um, industry, oil and gas industry, including Watania, which is a military-owned um, oil and gas firm. Um, the bottled water company, which is, of course, one of the military's sort of most famous um, firms. Uh, and so you see the government trying to, I think, the CC government trying to sort of uh, negotiate with these uh, golf firms that want in to these investments and then mediating what I imagine would be substantial um, domestic opposition to basically selling the entire state to Gulf investors. Mm -hmm. And so you see um, a lot of domestic Egyptian sort of business elites um, being the military reaching out to them to try to get them either willingly or unwillingly in some cases uh, to put up their money to actually float some of the privatizations of these uh, state-owned firms as an alternative to just sort of selling everything 
uh, in a fire sale to golf investors. And I think the the the, the tension that that has caused um, between the Gulf states and the CC regime is going to be, I think, really critical in the next few months. Um, Shauna, this is this can't be more uh, um, precise or on point because we have seen Egypt uh, uh, benefiting from what 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 what. Uh, um, uh, experts have been noticing they've been, been benefiting from the war on the border, been uh, uh, approaching deals, whether it's from the IMF, whether it's from the Gulf, um, and and this narrative has been completely clear also on the regional wider uh, 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 narratives, which brings me to to uh, ask Nancy, and, and can't be like more directed to anyone but you, uh, well, Egypt has been a proximity and a historical uh, relationship with Palestine and uh, uh, with uh, uh, Israel, and it makes um, Cairo a pivotal uh, uh, to any stable outcome from, from uh, uh, the current war uh, on Gaza. On the other hand, the war in Gaza has brought significant implication for democracy and for human rights inside Egypt and in, in, in the region. How has the U.S. foreign policy, Egypt foreign policy, uh, uh, and the militarization in both affected uh, the region? And what are the challenges arising uh, from ac for accountability and for human rights? In sum, what did the war reveal about the international system and the regional system? Well, thank you, Yasmin, and thank you so much, uh, Tess, as well, for having me at this important event. Uh, I've been on panels with Shana and Hisham before, and they are always a hard act to follow, and I don't know I, why I keep doing this to myself, <laughs> but they make my job easier. Um, and again, it's just like the, the nuance they provide and, and the eloquence in, and the organized uh, ideas and thoughts that they have makes it easy to really look at this from a different angle and see why did we end up here. And I want to start by your last question, the last part of your question, what does this tell us about the international system? Any crisis that happens, particularly global crises, is always a moment of clarity. It provides clarity about our capacities, uh, systems of governments, international relations, and theories of change. And, um, and it just like brings also, I mean, to light the pathologies of our system. Well, just like the COVID-19 has revealed a lot about the capacity of international organizations, the WHO, and the capacities within governments, the power grab. And just like as uh, COVID-19 affected people with underlying health, pre-existing health conditions more severely than healthy ones, and so does other crises as well. I mean, they hit countries and governments that have underlying problems and bring them to light and also I mean, magnifies them. Uh, so, except <laughs> Gaza is not a crisis, it's not a national disaster that happens to us. It's man-made and we're all responsible and we're all implicated. It's something that is happening by particular actors and can be stopped. And that's the important thing to note here. Now, the things that it, it reveals, it reveals things about effective governance uh, domestically and around borders. It reveals a lot about regional dynamics and on the effectiveness of an independence of international institutions uh, and the so-called rule-based world order. And uh, about the theories of change and assumptions upon which the foreign policy towards the world, particularly from like the international, like Western developed world, uh, and great powers uh, to our region and uh, and what it means. And I want to start by the last one. And I think if we can summarize it in the overall approach towards the region uh, from the U.S. perspective, have a lot of problems. One, it's becoming more and more transactional. Second, it's highly militarized. And third, it is based on like the conception of arms for peace, which means like instead of addressing the issue and the problem and, and seeking 
uh, lasting peace that is based on justice and human rights and dignity for all, it's based mo mostly on control. And this control is dependent on strong men that they think and assume that they are stable and staying on forever and also reliable allies. So that's one thing. And because of that, we see some of the the, the four so-called normalization deals, which this, the Abraham Accords, were basically a manifestation of this. It was not, these were not normalization deals that is granting and dealing with people equally, particularly looking at the occupation and the status of the people in Gaza, thinking that this is a marginal issue that is going to go away, just by ignoring it. They continued on, unfortunately, with, I mean, with President Biden, just weeks before the October 7th attacks, when the negotiations for the US-Saudi defense deal was in ongoing. And uh, we've seen the result. I mean, not saying that this is in any way a justification or a direct result. It's an accumulation of the overall problem. And all of a sudden, they just always get surprised at things like blow up in our face. The second thing is that, that it challenges, I'm just going backwards, with the international institutions. Uh, we are seeing uh, international humanitarian organizations, or generally multilateral organizations, like the World Food Program. With all its capabilities, with all its resources, they cannot pass food and essential medicine into Gaza. They just cannot. And it's not an issue of resources. It's an issue of political power and political demand. And also, one of it brings to light another issue on the side that we keep on talking about this rules-based world order uh, as if that this is the ideal way. I mean, only if we relinquish U.S. hegemony that this is what we are going to end up with. But as we see that in reality, that they are not independent and they're not effective. And also, looking at the United Nations itself, we've seen how the role of the United States, China, and Russia have been just like playing chess with the world. It's like, you veto this, I veto that, I mean, I abstain. And it's just like really an embarrassment for all of us. And, and again, it's, it's, it's on, on us. I mean, we keep on working within the system, thinking that we can ameliorate it by just like patchwork instead of really rethinking those issues. And the problem with rethinking those issues is because the politicization internally in the US and other countries of those issues. Because when you come and talk about the rigged system and the problematic system and corruption of international uh, institutions, that puts you in the camp of the other, the conservatives and, and the people that we are fighting. So that becomes a priority over actually facing problems that we are seeing and, and, and carrying the brunt of it, not us. I mean, of course, the Gazans are the first place. And then coming to regional powers, and, and I think Shanna just like put it like really eloquently describing really the problem of the Gulf like bailing out Egypt every time. And as uh, Hisham says, is like uh, always that Egypt is too big to fail. And it's two things. I mean, Egypt is too big to fail and they're playing a game of extortion because this is what Sisi provides, I mean, like sort of warn the people. I mean, you've seen what happened in Syria. I mean, they're a quarter of the size of the population of Egypt. Imagine if you have a crisis with a country the size of Egypt. So it's like this extortionist view. And also, I mean, like the more Egypt gets money and the more it's near default, you know, it's just like saying if you owe the bank a dollar, you're in trouble. If you owe the bank a million dollars, the bank is in trouble. I mean, and this is the case, I mean, that we're seeing that um, that every time the IMF provides a loan, that Egypt does not keep up even with, I mean, the rules and the conditions that it puts on, they go on and ask for another one and another one because they only want to keep, like, kicking the can down the road. They do not want to resolve the problem. Now, coming 
Um, to the last point of what it reveals about domestic politics and power, I mean, all, is th all of this is being done, I mean, with the assumption that we want Egypt to be stable. And we want to keep Sisi in power because it keeps it stable. Now, looking at what's happening right now, no stable country can just maintain uh, this like uh, long-term stability when it doesn't have sovereignty. And no country that does not have control over its economy independently could have sovereignty. And we're seeing that playing out with how we're seeing, for example, the underlying elements of the UAE deal with Egypt, the $35 billion. And we all know it's like under the table, part of it is an agreement related to Gaza and the Palestinian people. I mean, it's not sp outspoken, but it's... It's implicit and understood. This is not sovereignty. The second thing is just like being able to control your borders. It's also such a huge embarrassment for Egypt that trucks are just stopping on at the Rafah crossing and they cannot just move an inch without, I mean, the acceptance of Israel, without the power of the international uh, community where people in Egypt are protesting at the borders. People are just like showing and, and voicing their anger, not just in Egypt. I mean, like I know people around the world like travel <laughs> to Egypt trying to go and protest there. Yet Egypt is showing like this level of meagerness and inability and weakness and in order to not be able to even move one truck forward. The other thing is like the obscene complicity in the misery of the Gazan peoples. I mean, like, uh, many of you already know this. I mean, the Hela company that is uh, headed or owned by Al Argeni, who is like sort of uh, an official thug <laughs> that works with the state security. And, and because of his position, I mean, he is able to control what people have to pay as an extortion, not as a fee, in order to be able to cross. And we end up with cases like it used to be $500 before the war. It became $6,000 and then $9,000. Some people died on the borders because they could not raise that kind of money. So this is what such crises reveal on all those issues. I mean, like on the domestic level, on the international level, and on foreign policy level. Nancy, thank you so much because you brought so much context in only 10 minutes, which could take like hours and hours of discussion and also summed up some of the, uh, the characteristics of how Egypt is implicating the whole situation, even internationally, even Egypt was one of the countries sponsored the recent uh, UN resolution, and yet we are still mentioning all these uh, 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 tensions. That brings me back to ask Hisham. Well, now it's the part of way forward. What are we going to do? How are we going to move uh, after this. And with all the characteristics you brought, all the, the, the highlights of Sisi's ruling that you brought in your paper and your talk now, um, what do we expect in the third term of Sisi's ruling? How is it going to get worse and how? Thank you so much. Um, well, the, any question that poses sort of... Uh, that is geared towards prediction is always difficult for me to grapple with. Uh, but uh, I know I'm visiting, I'm visiting from California, but I'm still actually a creature of DC. And I've come to learn that whenever anybody asks you to make a, a prediction about the future, all you need to do is just to make a vague statement that's non-falsifiable, like the next six months are gonna be very critical, which means absolutely nothing. <laughs> but um, so yeah, the next six months are gonna be very critical. I agree. But anyway, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't make any prediction, but I can tell you what I'm going to be looking for. Mm -hmm. and, and I think everybody will be looking at how um, the Egyptian government will be using the very temporary and conditional um, lifeline that uh, the investment deal with the UAE and all of the dollars that that actually provided the Egyptian state with, how that... Um, how that and the IMF loan, how that lifeline will be used by the Egyptian government. And here the question that uh, people are posing is whether the Egyptian government will be using this as an opportunity to lay the groundwork and foundations for a change in course. 
a change in course that moves us away from the business as usual of the past 10 years of large uh, spending on um, transport infrastructure and large uh, state-led mega projects, and instead uh, advance a national economic development strategy. Uh, right, so a national economic development strategy that um, uh, you know that uh, has the legitimate buy-in of the Egyptian people, and that also engages the private sector on fair terms, and uh, that uh, a strategy that prioritizes social justice, and that uh, secures and protects Egypt's sovereignty and political independence, which, by the way, is something that the IMF and the Gulf countries are not going to do for Egypt. You need the Egyptian people involved in this process in order for this to actually happen. Uh, and finally, a strategy that uh, distributes the costs and uh, the burdens of economic recovery and economic reform and transformation in a manner that is just, that's fair, that's equitable. Achieving this in my own mind, is not just about convening the economists and adjudicating between one economic rationality or another, but it's actually about opening the political field in a way that allows for meaningful transparency, mm -hmm. meaningful accountability, and most importantly, meaningful public debate about Egypt's economic future. It's not, about, it's not just about restoring faith in the economy, but it's about restoring people's faith in the political process and that their belief that that political process provides a viable and credible vehicle for advancing long-standing popular demands for economic justice. Mm -hmm. I think we've all experienced for the past decade the rule of the one voice, and by all objective standards and setting aside all polemics, mm -hmm the results have fallen short and they have not served the Egyptian people well. Now you need the legitimate buy-in of the Egyptian people. You need the support of strong and credible political institutions that can hold governments accountable and that are capable of representing Egypt's national interests and to dig their heels in and uphold Egypt's national, uh, national interests in the face of IFIs and other investors and other creditors who may not have Egypt's best interest at heart. And once again, I'll repeat that the, I, the, I, the IFIs and the Gulf countries are not going to do this for Egypt. Egypt needs to do this for Egypt, right? It's not just about, I mean, at the, at the I don't want to sound polemic, but Egypt doesn't need another sugar daddy or another like Splenda daddy or any of these people. Egypt needs a national economic development strategy. And so this is... Um, so that, that is all to say. This is like a long-winded way of saying that I'll be waiting to see whether the political leadership will rise up to the occasion and enact the political changes that are necessary to be able to grapple with the impending economic challenges that Egypt is confronting at the moment. But I'll be very honest with you, Asmin, and uh, here is the plot twist. I will not be holding my breath. <laughs> the second thing, and very briefly, that I'll be looking at is the regime's management of its own political apparatus. Mm -hmm. As uh, I've written a little bit about that in that uh, Journal of Democracy piece that you've mentioned, but I've also discussed that in finer details in uh, my Jadadeh article, um, Grooming and Gaslighting in Egypt's New Republic. But to make a long story short, since 2018, the political leadership has invested a great deal in the Mustaqbal Watan Party, which has become its de facto political arm. This is, was partly the product of uh, the regime's realization that it cannot work the political field effectively without, an, uh, without a viable ruling party, and partly the pressures that are coming in from the traditional political classes that were inherited from the Mubarak era and who are now demanding political access and political prestige. So, uh, but to make a long story short, despite the fact that the party now is holding this high profile and is very, it's been um, stuck in what I call this acting ruling party space, where it's not a ruling party, it's an acting ruling party where it's responsible for holding and managing the majority in parliament, but it's not recognized, and it's also tasked with, as you've seen, you've mentioned the election, in mobilizing uh, supporters on behalf of the regime during election seasons and critical moments, but it's still not recognized as an official ruling party. So I'm gonna be seeing whether this Mustaqbal Watan party over the course of the next year and the, and the aftermath of this election will be able to break out of that um, 
awkward political friend zone that it's been stuck in with the ruling establishment over the past several years, and whether it will be playing uh, you know, a bigger role in uh, governance and in bureaucratic structures. And I will be seeing how this evolving relationship will affect the regime's ability to manage state-led uh, politics, as well as its own ability to manage its own personalist sensibilities and its longstanding resistance to uh, any type of institutionalization inside of its own political machine. And I'd be happy to talk about this in the discussion if people are interested, but again, I will not be holding my breath. Thank you. Well, we understand that uh, predictability is not something that we expect with Egypt, but thank you so much for laying out the markers to what to expect in the upcoming phase, not six months, of course, probably more. But giving the, the same context, it's a time of making a lot of big decisions, economically, security-wise. And given the, that the military has been doing all these decisions, security se sector has been making all these decisions, I wanted to ask Shana, uh, well, w what to expect, the mil how the military rule is, uh, rule is going to evolve in the upcoming uh, um, CC ruling term? And what to expect this rule to, to how, how would, would, he, would it impact the war on the, on, on the side and impact all the economic deals that are, are, are taking place now in Egypt? And how this would affect the Egyptian people? Um, I will also say that the next six to eight months will definitely be critical. <laughs> um, so, um, I, my students always sort of uh, get angry at me because I talk too much about the Gulf um, states and how critical they are in, in what happens in the region. But, um, of course, you know, initially after the, the coup, there was a real sort of e explosion of militarization um, you know, in the Sinai, right, as the regime sort of um, was targeting individuals that they assumed were affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. There was a lot of violence, a lot of death. I mean, that was a, a really a, a terrible period. But now you, you, you have the continued sort of militarization of the Sinai in response to um, Israel's war on Gaza. Um, but I really think that um, the UAE still is, is, is really critical in terms of, of what we're seeing. Um, so not only, I mean, you can look and you can see that the UAE has absolute sort of impunity um, in what goes on in the region, especially in terms of what they've been doing in Yemen. And I would encourage folks to watch that BBC documentary about the Emirates assassination campaigns using um, American mercenaries um, to hunt down regular sort of just political party members um, in Yemen, right? Um, but also all of its sort of uh, activities in the Horn of Africa, you know, trying to secure access to ports and basically it expand its sort of imperial sphere of influence, right, in the entire sort of Red Sea um, uh, uh, African coastal sort of area. Um, and I think that's very much tied in with this. The Abraham Accords, I think, were really fundamentally about the Emirates and Saudi Arabia being able to collaborate and coordinate with Israel on issues related to weapons technologies and surveillance technologies. Of course, the UAE has had some of these partnerships going back to 2007, which is not um, – so this wasn't like a huge – sort of break from them, but it was going to allow for just a, a really dramatic expansion of the sort of partnerships between Emirati firms and Israeli firms. And I think that because that partnership, those relationships can't move forward until there's a resolution of the Israeli war on Palestine, that the, that the Emirates are very, very sort of laser focused um, on Egypt being sort of the linchpin or the release valve for that conflict and the way for them, you know, to sort of realize that outcome is by getting the Egyptians to basically take in all of these um, people fleeing Gaza. Now, I don't... The Egyptian regime, of course, has been very, I think, resistant sort of publicly to that, right? They imprisoned that, even that police officer, right? An Egyptian police officer who said something about solidarity with Palestine and then he sort of disappeared, uh, was disappeared or taken, uh, arrested and taken to prison. So it's sort of unclear to me whether the, the CC's government is uh, 
is just trying to sort of look tough, like we're not, you know, going to be um, the solution to basically a problem that Israel has obviously created. But I think that the intensity of that military relationship between, I guess, a, a triad really, the Gulf states, Israel, and Egypt, is so critical and, and important to the Gulf states that they are willing to sort of, you know, maybe sacrifice Sisi as an individual leader, right? So you would have, you know, a, a change of the whoever's leading the government, but not necessarily a change of the regime itself and the, and the military as sort of the head of the state or the sort of pillar of the state. But that's sort of what I'm expecting is, is something that is potentially sort of in the ether in terms of, of that relationship and how that's going to play out in terms of the, the war, the Israeli war on Gaza, and how that is really going to create, I think, an enormous amount of spillover violence and further militarization and securitization of that whole sort of region. Thank you, Shauna. And uh, also another thing to watch for. Um, that takes me to Nancy to ask you the big question. Sorry, you're having all the, the like the, the aftermath uh, uh, question. Well, looking forward, what strategies should be employed to address all the challenges posed by the U.S. foreign policy militarization and to promote a greater accountability within the international system, within the war on Gaza, and also for the corruption and for abuse of power in, in Egypt and in the region? And do the current circumstances play any role in, stab in stabilizing the Sisi's autocratic rule? A lot of observers think that Sisi always benefit from international disruptive uh, in, uh, uh, disruptive incidents. He's always, always benefit from others' agony, and evidently he's been negotiating a loan with the IMF for three billion dollars, and eventually got eight. So, as you mentioned, there is a deal under the table. How do we look at this, and how do we proceed? Right. I mean, I, I want to refer to Hisham's I mean, just like analysis of this because it's quite nuanced and, and revealing because a lot of people always assume uh, whenever there is a crisis, it, it works in the benefit of CC or the dictator. This one is different. Uh, and this one is different not just for Egypt, but internationally. For Egypt, the issue of Palestine and the issue of Gaza is, as Hisham puts it, would mobilize constituencies that would otherwise be apathetic to other issues, right? Democracy and human rights. And this puts Sisi in a very vulnerable situation. Vulnerable situation towards the people, I mean, their anger and absorbing their anger, adding to that also, I mean, the economic decline. Also, their, his vulnerability towards the military, because the military's most important goal is to pres preserve itself as an institution. The moment it feels that he's a liability, they will, they will throw him under the bus. I mean, to what extent he is securing himself, he's like have a very tight circle of power and very low threshold for trust. And he has his two sons in very critical positions. So he's, he's having all that. But the enormity of what's happening right now is not as any other crisis. That's one thing. Internationally, also, we're not in 2003, where the US would go and invade Iraq, and people would just like sit on their hands and watch. I mean, not that people were sitting <laughs> in their hands. I mean, like oh, my first protest in, in Egypt was about that. But if you look around the world, I mean, people, the reason why we have, I mean, I'm not going to talk about the U.S., but talking about normal countries, uh, where we've seen shifts in their position. We've seen, for example, the position of Germany at the beginning of the war and now. Those shifts are not just coming from thin air. These are coming because of people's pressure and other factors. But we've seen, I've never seen such solidarity around any issue, particularly around Palestine, across the world. And that's why people who imagine that this is an isolated issue uh, is like, it's a misdiagnosis. It's affecting everyone. And people are seeing it as an insult 
to our humanity and our integrity and our dignity. So the 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 rise in the activism that we're seeing in various spaces, like even in the art world, um, is significant. And that's why the problem with the U.S. and the international community putting their bets on governments is a huge mistake because those governments as well as any political animal will care about their stability and their stability would not stay with the anger of the people. So my bet is on civil society and this is what we need to continue working with for the most important tool we have is accountability. Uh, and this is what we need to keep pushing for. And um, I want to leave like time for discussion, but over the past two days, uh, we were expecting a decision from uh, the State Department on NSM 20, which is National Security Memo, about whether Israel is abiding by or, or um, is, uh, is not in violation of international human laws or U.S. laws. I mean, the evidence are there, and they're obvious. Is the U.S. capable of coming today as it has been like flip-flopping around the thing and, and saying like, no, they're not in violation. I mean, they have been <laughs> like making those absurd statements before. But the fact that they are not like confidently making those statements is because of the different variables that are out there. It is not like the past that you can just go and just be all the way supportive of Israel without concerns about what the implications would be, even for their own political gain. gain. And we've seen I mean, just like the votes of the uncommitted uh, in the primaries. This is a message that is being sent that we are not just uh, like insignificant voters that you bring in whenever you want to just cross to the other term. And, and this is what's giving me hope. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a dark moment. It's a moment of failure of our humanity. Uh, but I think uh, it's a different time as well. Uh, and I think uh, pushing for accountability and relying on civil society, I don't <laughs> put my bets on even international organization uh, because, I mean, we already spoke about the problems about that, the problem that they are political organizations posing as a political organization, and they are not. And as long as we are not facing this fact, as long as we're not facing uh, issues of corruption, I mean, it's just like, I mean, I've been asked many times to do, conduct an evaluation for USAID and uh, other projects related to OECD. The first thing they tell me is like, do whatever you like, just don't approach the issue of corruption or politics. He was just like, why do you bother in the first place? I mean, so these are the points, I mean, they're, they're the weak points and their vulnerability and our strongest tool, and, and we should keep pushing for it. Uh, thank you, Nancy, for, for bringing this tension also about the hope and the voices of the people. I want to highlight that Hisham wrote a beautiful piece to Mirab about the Egyptian people uh, protesting for Palestine and un even under uh, repression and even when they know they will be arrested and after enduring a repressive environment for so long people are still have hope and they still work on the ground and we shouldn't give up on them um, thank you so much for everything that you brought to the table and now to open the floor for discussion if anyone has any questions please raise your hand we have about 10 minutes to uh, take questions from the audience Please go ahead uh, and uh, microphone and please uh, introduce yourself. Sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sabur. I work for the Solidarity Center. Thank you so much for the, the insightful um, debate uh, uh, on the crisis in Egypt. My question is uh, in light of the deteriorating uh, political situation in Egypt, uh, what are the lesson learn lessons learned from the first two terms of CC? This is rules in Egypt for the civil society organizations, um, independent media outlets, the labor unions, <clears throat> and other democratic institutions. Um, and what what the strategies should they invent to approach his third term? And my question is to Dr. Hisham Salam. Thank, Thank you. you. Should we group a set um, of questions and maybe pile them on? Yes, probably. If anyone else has any questions, please. 
And I see also Amr over there. Uh, Thank you. This was a really wonderful panel. My name is Nate Grubman. I work at the National Democratic Institute. Um, I, I think one of the interesting takeaways of Hisham's piece and of this session is that economic decisions that might be objectively foolish or foolish for the Egyptian people as a whole benefits um, particular groups that form a part of uh, Sisi's coalition. I'd love to hear a little bit more about how um, the conditionality of aid, the, the reforms that, that might be um, pushed upon this regime might change its political economy. What sorts of reforms would be sufficient to create conditions for the course change that Hisham described? Thank you all so much. Really wonderful panel. Thank you. Um, another question over there? Thank you. I have a couple of uh, questions, if that's okay. One's for Dr. Islam and one's for Dr. Uh, Shaina. The first for Dr. Islam is, to what extent do you think that the successive economic crises have affected Sisi's, the consolidation or the fragmentation of his elite? Thinking of your, like, your grooming and gaslighting piece, um, th has it facilitated further fragmentation for some coup proofing or uh, purposes, or have, has, has he consolidated a little bit more for some of the same reasons? And for uh, Dr. Shane, I was wondering, um, you talked a little bit, you, t you talked a lot about the relationship between Gulf and Egypt, and at some point here in DC, the Gulf was bankrolling CC's PR, right? And the Egyptian government's PR. To what extent do you think this crisis is going to change their uh, consolidated front in DC, so to say, right? Like as their interests diverge and some countries are a lot wealthier than others, to what extent do you, do you think that's gonna affect Egypt's standing in the city? Thank you. Also given the Menendez news and what, what might that uh, implications of that. Thank you so much. Uh, we have multiple questions for Dr. Hisham. Uh, so we'll start with you. Um, lesson learns. All right, well, uh, so I'll start with uh, Sabur. Uh, thank you, thanks for, for raising, raising these important issues. Uh, it's very difficult to talk about strategies for change in an environment that is so oppressively closed. I mean, one of the things that distinguishes the political status quo from the years of contention that preceded the Arab uprisings is the discrepancy in how the political space is managed, right? So we definitely see that clear departure from this model of liberalized autocracy that used to exist in the decades prior to um, the Arab uprisings. And, uh, you know, this was a moment in which, uh, of course, liberalized autocracy, I think my my friend and former dissertation advisor, Dan Brumberg, always used this term to describe the tendency of autocrats, not just in Egypt, but in the Arab world, to use uh, limited political space and limited liberties and to erect the facade of a democratic process through state-managed uh, political competition. Everybody knew that Hosni Mubarak was there to stay. Everybody knew that um, Ali Abdullah Saleh was there to stay, but these, these were ruling establishments that had a vested interest in erecting the facade of democracy and in allowing for some competition during election seasons, allowing for some, for some expressions of the dissent uh, in, uh, in the media, allow for some um, nominal uh, but you know, sometimes meaningful power for elected institutions, parliaments, legislatures. And in a reality in which all of this has just been negated and completely obliterated, it's very difficult to talk about strategies for change from within. And I think this is one of the structural impediments that um, I think is facing Egypt's political community. One of the things that is so distinctive about the mode of state-managed politics that exists in Egypt today is that the state is putting much less emphasis on these formal political spaces. There's no interest in the elections. As a matter of fact, there's no interest in, in, in even choreographing the slightest hint of competition. It's not where, their head, where the political leadership's head is at. The name of the game for them in terms of where they're trying to create that facade of democracy is in these convention center spaces, these highly choreographed spaces that are happening 
through things like the National Dialogue, the youth conventions, and it's, I, I mean, it's not, it's not coincidental that this so-called National Dialogue that is happening right now is managed by the same uh, state-led body that actually, you know, um, produces and organizes these uh, youth-led uh, political simulations, like political simulation of the Egyptian government or parliament, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the same organization, the same body that is actually organizing the dialogue. That is to say that um, I'm, I'm copying out of this question a little bit by saying that the structural impediments are so close that I don't see how we can actually move away from this just relying on the initiative of civil society and on um, uh, the political community, the independent political, I'm not gonna even use the term opposition, but the independent political community that still somewhat exists in Egypt at the moment. And I think the onus, but that said, the, imper the imperative for making these changes, the imperative for creating that space is, has, is actually increasing from the perspective of the political leadership for the reasons that I've outlined in my presentation. And that maybe gives us maybe like 1% hope. But again, I'm not, to sort of return my earlier statement, I will not be holding my breath. Um, conditionality of aid, I'm gonna make a very quick comment here. I think it's important to mention if we're talking about conditionalities, the conditionality assumes that there are serious international actors and that there are serious people here in Washington DC who are interested in promoting political change, progressive and inclusive political change at very high level of policy making. I'm not talking at the level of implementers. I'm not talking about the level of bureaucracy, but that assumes that there is a political will that exists. And I think from the perspective of anybody who has lived the course of the past 10 years, I mean, Shana Marshall mentioned, mentioned this, mentioned sort of the, the US responses and European responses to uh, 2013 in Egypt, but also the same story repeated itself over and over and over again. Um, Egypt, uh, you're talking about transgressions that kept happening in Saudi Arabia and by the Saudi Arabian regimes in other countries, transgressions that are happening all over the region. Tunisia happens, everything, all of this happened, and yet the response has been thoughts and prayers from the US government. So uh, once again, I think you know if, if the point of departure, if the political will is there, I find it very difficult to think of a path where um, you can actually, you know, a, a process by which these actors, especially, you know, if we're talking about the United States and, and the EU, to actually dictate the terms of political change. I just don't see political will, but obviously the low-hanging fruit from my modest assessment, I would love to hear what, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Marshall and, and Dr. Aquil have to say about this. Uh, but my, my thinking is that the low-hanging fruit right here is the question of political prisoners. Just, I mean, I'm not talking about fundamental political reforms. Just if people have been, you know, behind bars for over two years in a context in which it's illegal to actually keep people behind bars if they haven't been convicted or taken to trial, just release them. Implement the laws. Implement the laws. Let's not have a discussion about it, not have a dialogue about this. Just implement the laws as a starting point, as a way of showing goodwill and lending credibility to that process of dialogue that you've instituted. So this is kind of would be a good place. To, it's not a great place to end, but I would say that this would be a good, um, a good place to, to start. Amr's question, I'm just gonna say very quickly, the further, I mean, um, I mean, this is a longer story and I would, Love to also um, to hear, of course, Dr. Marshall and Dr. Aquil's thoughts about this. But my modest observation, uh, Amr, is that you know what is very interesting to me about that process that you're referring to, kind of like the re-emergence or resurgence that happens in the uh, Mubarakist political elite, uh, you know that. Uh, emerged after, tw or resur researched in the political arena after 2018. What is very interesting to me is how this actually, um, the climax of this process in more recent years also coincides with a reality in which the state has become 
um, dependent on some of these figures that came from the Mubarak's ruling establishment, or at least the Mubarak's clique, to facilitate privatization deals with the, with the Gulf. And a lot of people are pointing towards situations where particular interlocutors are coming back to the public arena because of the role that they're actually playing in facilitating these privatization and investment deals that are um, some of them are ongoing, and some of them are in the in the in the news. There's more to be said, but I'm just going to cede the floor to my colleagues here. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, really quite great questions. Um, so, and thank you, Hashem. Those are also um, really wonderful um, insights. So, yeah. Um, this question of whether sort of the interests of the of Egypt and the Gulf states are sort of starting to diverge, um, of course, there's yeah the the Gulf has for you know for a long time underwritten um, a lot of the operations of the that are going on in the big mirrored buildings that you see <laughs> right all around us the the PR firms the government relations firms the strategic consulting firms many of which are named after you know former secretaries of state and and members of high ranking members of government um, it's really sort of a jobs program for like white collar professionals in the United States um, somebody pointed this out i think 60 years ago right that the rise of of gulf uh, sort of capital um, and how uh, important the U.S. was to the continuation and the expansion of Gulf capital was going to mean <laughs> that there was going to be an enormous amount of money coming into just this like professional class of public relations experts um, in the United States. So that was a very prescient um, <laughs> prediction. Um, uh, these PR firms, and also I would I, I would say that a lot of the think tanks, right, not just the ones that are uh, explicitly and overtly funded by the Gulf states, but also the ones that get sort of money through intermediaries or private equity funds that you, where you don't know where the money's coming from, but you have an idea of where the money's coming from, um, and from oil companies and even national oil companies. Um, there, That's where the, the sort of the, unfortunately, a lot of the policy, uh, I think, actually gets made. Right, and then it sort of percolates up into Congress. Right, it's not actually being made in Congress; it's being made in in these sort of backroom deals in these in these glass buildings, and then it sort of gets packaged, and then it gets sent to the the staff members, and then it makes it <laughs> into the congressional offices. And I think that's a um, a real problem. But the Gulf has, of course, underwritten that on behalf of Egypt uh, financially, um, you know, for for quite a long time. That scandal with Bob Menendez, I think, was very um, telling. Of course, uh, everybody probably knows the, the details of this because they're, frankly, pretty ridiculous and sort of hilarious, the gold bars and, and the text messages and sort of how ham-fisted um, it was. But it, that might suggest that maybe, you know, Egypt feels like it needs to start doing its own um, sort of PR um, lobbying uh, and corruption and bribery because the Gulf states are sort of getting tired and, and a little bit um, pissed off with what's going on in Egypt and the fact that, you know, that some of the financial reforms, of course, because the Gulf really wanted uh, Egypt to let the currency devalue dramatically because, of course, then when they bought all these firms, the amount of money that they were going to have to pay for them was going to be a lot less. Right, and of course, Egypt was trying to stave off that massive devaluation for the exact same reason, right? Because then when they sold, when they privatized these firms, the amount of hard currency that would be coming into the Egyptian central bank would actually be much more. So there was this real struggle for a very long period, and they went back and forth. So there were these, you know, Emirati firms that would say, okay, we'll buy, you know, the tobacco company or the water bottle company or this oil company or whatever. And Egypt would say, okay, you can buy it for this much. And they would sort of uh, draw out the process waiting, the Emiratis or the, or the, the Saudis or the Kuwaitis or the Qataris waiting for, <laughs> for the currency to, to continue to devalue more. And of course that was putting the brakes on the IMF um, negotiations because the IMF wanted uh, guarantees of investment from the Gulf states to sort of backstop the IMF's loans <laughs> to Egypt. So there was all of these people, these different parties with very different interests trying to position vis-a-vis -vis one another, and that was creating sort of a real, I guess, uh, bottleneck um, in the process. 
that apparently has been worked out, right? So the IMF has agreed to the, the that $8 billion loan. And then the UAE, of course, ag agreed to the $35 billion um, investment that would take place between now and a the end of April, which is an extremely short time frame to be investing $35 billion. Um, I guess not if you have that much money. <laughs> the currency of the realm is currency, right? That's a, a famous line from Pirates of the Caribbean 2, a very, a very underappreciated film. Um, yeah, so I, I think that you, yeah, you do see, you do see this divergence because, um, yeah, the Emiratis want, um, I think, also managers and other shareholders of these firms that they can rely on in a fiscal way, which when Hashem was talking about some of the the fulul, I guess, the people coming who are sort of resurfacing from the Mubarak era, because the Emiratis, I think, want to partner with those people, those ruling class sort of Egyptian elites, because those are, they're the ones that have the international contacts, they're the ones that have the history of, of operating large, uh, you know, multi-million or billion dollar businesses in Egypt, and, and those are the people that they want to partner with. So I think there's, and they're not necessarily the, the people that are most supportive of CC, and so yeah, I think there's a lot of struggle over sort of, yeah, who gets to decide what happens now. And uh, the last word uh, goes to Dr. O'Kale, and especially I would love to hear your perspective on con con conditionality of aid and how how, how will we move forward. Well, I mean, one of the biggest problems we have not the biggest, but the issue with the lack of aid conditionality from the U.S. towards Israel is it sets a precedent, completely undermines the credibility of the U.S., and it makes it very difficult after that to try to impose conditionality on other countries where we're seeing <laughs> using U.S. weapons, even that was like implicated in the killing of 30,000 plus people in five months uh, and causing a famine. So this is why like it's one of the things that we are focusing on here, like with folks who are working on uh, on foreign policy in general, but also particularly on Gaza, not just for the current moment, because again, as we say, what's happening in Gaza is only a symptom of a bigger problem that we have. And, and this is why it's important to address this. Again, issues like, for example, example like corruption cases like Menendez, if he's just like, if he gets away with this, hopefully not, uh, it just sends all the wrong messages about not just the integrity of the system over here, but what is being uh, permissive uh, of uh, with other countries, with other dictators. I mean, of course, I mean, like we've had enough talk about the double standards in so many ways. Is like not people, not all people's lives are valued the same way. Also, the perspective of like the the view of people in in the middle east in general is has been like that for a long time i mean they deserve their dictators kind of work um the other part is just like wanted to like really quickly uh, touch upon the issue of reforms and 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 like hisham i'm not holding my breath but no matter how the government is trying to close down the political space at the end of the day people need to have their own survival mechanisms. And by doing that, it's not called politics, but they self-organize. As we find right now, which is actually dangerous and puts the, the government in a, in a vulnerable position, is the parallel structures that people informally uh, organize. Like for example, having like certain professions like in the media or musicians, like get together, uh, and decide that they're gonna raise their fees into a particular level and they all agree on it. This is politics. And uh, and also, I mean, whether within the unions and outside the unions, even it's like even have a, <laughs> Egypt has a huge informal sector and there's a lot of play and dynamic within that where people are also, I mean, fascinatingly, it is like the uh, YouTubers who, the women who sells products online, they have been arguing, like, coordinating together to what extent like an inflation level of increase of prices is acceptable. These are all ways of self-organizing that also undermines the government because you're creating another. Other people are actually relying on their own security, um, I mean, uh, agencies and security, private security firms uh, because they are not relying on the government. These are all ways of 
acting politically without <laughs> it being looking political, and also at the same time it's undermining the government. And just one thing about <laughs> the, the the lobbying, it, just, it wasn't just the Gulf. I mean, like the biggest lobbyist for Egypt during the coup was Israel. I mean, doing it like, it's like in charity, of course. Uh, so it's not just uh, that. I mean, it's just like, and my colleague here, Matt Dasso, I mean, always says, like, the, it always starts with campaign financing if we need to reform anything, because it's key in actually how we proceed from there. Thank you very much. Dr. O'Kale, Dr. Marshall, Dr. Salem, thank you so much for honoring us with your presence today, for sharing your extensive expertise and fascinating perspective on Egypt, the region, and the world. And uh, on behalf of myself and the rest of MEDC team, thank you. And thank you so much, so much to the audience via live streaming and in person. Um, have a good night. Thank you.